Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and this is our Startup Basics series. Now in the Startup Basics series, which is brought to you by our good friends at Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, WSGR as they're referred to here in the Valley, or just Wilson Sonsini, great, great law firm. Uh, what we did with this series that they have underwritten is we take the most common questions that they get as attorneys, that I get as an entrepreneur and as an angel investor, and we answer them. And we do a ton of research, Emmy Award-winning producer Jackie, Jacob, the team here, Andrew, everybody researches them. And we find the information uh, across all the different people who might have blogged about it before, and we correlate it with my own personal experience, having run startups and invested in them for over 25 years. My gosh, I'm getting old. And I started young, and I've got a lot of battle scars to prove it. So here's just an overall way to look at why it's important to save money when running your co company, right? So this is a this is, this video is how to save money running your startup. Just how to be efficient, how to save money running your startup. Basically doing more with less. Now why is this important? Well, as entrepreneurs, we are given resources by investors typically or clients, we'll get into that. Uh, and we have to deploy them in a competitive world. So if you look at something like the NBA, there's a salary cap, there's a certain amount of money, and all the teams have a certain amount of parity because there's a cap. Well, in the real world, there is no salary cap. Anybody can spend any amount of money on anything, and people typically do. So when you have a competitive space, let's take Uber versus Lyft. I'm an investor in Uber. Um, Uber has raised so much more money than Lyft. Lyft has raised so much more, more money than Sidecar that there is no salary cap in that space. There are tons of investors who will pile on to the biggest winner, Uber. They'll, some investors will put money into the second winner, um, let's say Lyft, and you know very few people will go to the third or the fourth person. So you are in a race that is unfair and it is brutal and you need resources. So you have to prove as an entrepreneur that you know how to deploy resources intelligently so that people with the resources, i.e. venture capitalists, angel investors, rich individuals, can feel confident that giving you money uh, will be, the money they give you will be well spent, right? They don't wanna give it to some idiot who then loses their money. Um, and if you can be more accurate with your bullets, you're gonna kill more zombies, right? So in the zombie apocalypse, like you wanna be a sniper, right? You wanna just pick them off and not waste any bullets. Same thing here, right? Everything comes back to the zombie apocalypse. So here is a couple of tips if you're starting your company out. And the first one seems obvious and things have changed radically for startups. We used to go get office space and we'd rent an office and we would get a lease and we'd sign a lease and we'd get a real estate broker. Never do that. This is a horrible thing to do. Many businesses in Web 1.0 went out of business because they had too much office space and they couldn't sublet it. It was a huge disaster. People were spending more money on their real estate after they laid people off after the 1.0 explosion of dot-coms. They were spending more on their rent than their staff because they had laid so many people off and they had 50 people in spaces that could hold 500. Never sign a lease in the first year of your business. You should simply rent a desk. And when you go rent a desk, find a friend or a place that does desk rentals. Like I, I work at a WeWork. You know, I've got a... The launch uh, festival launch company does $3 million or something like that in revenue. We work out of WeWork because we only spend $6,500 a month. It's a controlled cost. We're only spending $75,000 a year on our office space. We would have to sign, excuse me, a lease for three years, and we'd have to get more space than we need, and it'd be totally inefficient. Just rent desks for $500 a piece or $300 a piece. Now, when you do get to the point, and this is tip number two, where you do afford an office, you want to get cheap office space. Unless your business is making money hand over fist, you're, you know, Dropbox or SurveyMonkey or Uber, and you just got a cash printing machine, you don't deserve Class A office space. You deserve to be in the beepiest part of town. Full stop. You don't deserve clean floors. You don't deserve elevators that work. You need to act like a startup. You need to walk up three flights of stairs, and if you get a big fancy office space, it sets the tone completely wrong for your startup. Everybody thinks, oh my God, we have this great office space. Oh, now we can all start spending money like idiots. Get a cheap office space. And when you do get that cheap office space, let me give you another piece of advice. Cheap desks, expensive chairs. Cheap desks, expensive chairs. Your desks at Amazon were made out of doors. Go get plywood doors. Put plywood doors under like... Um, you know, those little horses at Home Depot, call it a day. 
Your desk does not matter. Your chair does. So go buy some used Arions or sale chairs by Yves Bahar. Those things probably cost you 300 bucks used or something. That's worth it because people got to sit in their chair all day. But hey, listen, if you're starting out, just get folding chairs. Get you know cheap chairs. It doesn't matter. You have to uh, save money. Now, you want to defer salaries in the early days. So any way you can save money, it, you're well within your right to say to somebody who is a $100,000 a year programmer, hey, we just got our angel round for a quarter million dollars. We have to build out this product. Can I pay you 50% of your salary now and defer the other 50% if we get another round of funding? And we're going to give you this amount of stock compensation in lieu of that. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And you know what? If people believe in the mission and they understand you're a startup, they may want to help you out. And you may get four out of five people will help you out and you give them a little more equity. And then one person says, no, I need cash. I got a family. I got, I got to pay for my mortgage. I got to pay for my kid's private school. So sometimes that happens. But you don't know till you ask. And I've seen many founding teams live off of ramen salaries in, you know, outside of the elite parts of town or living off savings. And that's okay. And that's a good idea if you can swing it. Now, it's not a good idea to lose top-level talent because you're obsessed about this and you want everybody to live like a monk. That's not reasonable. But you can, in the early days, get people to take more stock than cash. And the, the conversation go like this. Hey, you asked for $100,000 and 25 basis points. We would like to offer you 50000 and a full basis point. One full point, rather. Not a basis point, a full point. So double the equity, but half the salary. Or we want to split the middle. We want to give you 75 in cash and we want to give you 40 basis points, something. You can, and if we get the next round of funding, we'll bump you up 10K or something. You know, you can come up with all those offers and let them make the case. And what you'll find is if people, people are not going to be offended by that. They're going to think you're savvy as a leader. So don't be afraid to negotiate on salary. And you can say, listen, we are not Google or Apple, but in Google or Apple, you're going to be working on an ad network or this little feature of the settings page on your iPhone or, or this little, you know, aspect of, you know, invading people's privacy with Facebook ads or something. And you're not going to feel great about yourself at the end of the day. And you're going to work with a team where you're like the thousandth spoke and the thousandth wheel. Well, how about you're one of the four wheels and we're going to get there together? Hey, that's pretty cool, right? So people will regularly take less money to be involved in a mission-based company and to be an early and get the lottery ticket of stock options. So don't be afraid to negotiate that. Now, here's one of my big tips. If you don't have money and you're doing an enterprise company especially, you should be going to your clients and saying, hey, I want to build this thing called Yammer or this thing called Dropbox uh, for enterprise or Box for enterprise, even better. Is there a way that if we built the solution for you, you would pay for a year in advance and we'll give you half price and we'll put a person on site to help you implement it? I got a lot of my businesses off the ground by getting clients to pay in advance. And if you have that conversation, if there's 10 people who want your product and you ask them, I'm guaranteeing you three or four of them will pay you in advance. And then all you have to do is go to the three or four and say, hey, you're our focus. And the other six who want to pay after the fact or they want to pay yearly or quarterly or something, uh, they don't want to pay yearly. They want to pay every month. That's fine. You can have them pay next month. And this is all if you're struggling as an entrepreneur. Now, if you have tons of money, you can take this advice and tweak it a little bit based on how big your bankroll is. Maybe you want to buy the fancy desks. I don't advise it. Now, with a law firm, most people don't know this, a little secret. If you've got a great idea and you've got some great advisors in your company, and I'll teach you how to get advisors in a second, you can go to a great law firm and say, listen, I got Jason Calacanis advising the company. I got Peter Rojas from Engadget. Um, would you mind deferring our $10,000 in legal fees? And when we hit $500,000 in equity, we'll pay you $10,000 in legal fees, uh, $500,000 in money raised. And when we hit a million dollars or $2 million, we'll pay you $25,000. And negotiate flat, wreath, flat fees with all your attorneys for that stuff. A lot of great law firms will look at it. And if you seem credible and if you've got some good advisors, they're going to go for it. Now, how do you get great advisors? You go find people who maybe aren't rich enough to put money in to your company as an angel investor. But you say, hey, you have massive credibility. You are a great VP of product here or there. Would you join our advisor board? We'll give you 25 basis points for four years of service, uh, one-year cliff, and then monthly after that. If you don't know about how equity um, – gets vested, you can uh, look that up. And getting a couple of advisors on builds your credibility. And what you want to do is put in, get like two advisors and then get advisors that are slightly better than those two and then get advisors who are slightly better than those four. Basically getting a little bit better as you go, right? More meaningful people uh, involved in your company. Now, outsourcing HR and accounting should seem obvious at this day and age. 
but some people still hire an HR person, hire an accounting person early on in the life of the company. That stuff should never be done. You want to use one of the great services out there that does outsource, and there's plenty of PEOs and outsourced accounting firms. Use them. And negotiate with your vendors. When they give you a price, get three quotes. I get three quotes on everything. And this is my process. Get three quotes. Make sure they're apples to apples, right? So you don't get into the stupid negotiation and say like, hey, you know, vendor, please give us an apples to apples. Um, uh, please make the quote with these line items, not just one item. Do your accounting. Give me like how much per hour, how much per hour overtime, how much to do the taxes. Then go back to all of them and say, hey, listen, I liked you best. You can say that to all three, by the way. And the deal's yours if we can do 50% deferred fees in the first year or if you're willing to do it for 30% off, something like that. You would be surprised how many vendors out there are already profitable and they want to help you grow your business because you might grow into the next Dropbox or Uber that they have as a client. So negotiate. And then that's my next tip. You want to negotiate with your vendors every six months to 12 months. I have so many people who've worked for me who are like, Jason, why are you such a jerk making us renegotiate with our cloud hosting, making us renegotiate with this company? And I'm like, well, because I want to put that money to work in other places. Now, you don't want to have your whole life being renegotiating the cost of pencils or something like that. But you do want uh, to negotiate hard on things that are reoccurring costs. Let's say anything you spend over $1,000 uh, a year on. I would say that's open for negotiation, and certainly anything above five dollars or $10,000 a year, you might have 20 of those $10,000 things a year. You want to negotiate all of those, and you want to negotiate every year, and never, never sign a contract that's more than month to month, or if it's a two-year contract, there needs to be a 30-day mutual out or a 60-day mutual out. What is a 60-day mutual out? That means that either party can cancel with 60 days notice. This way, you're not locked in. I have so many people who get locked into a contract for email services for 24 months, and they're not using a mail service that is uh, you know, month to month. You want to have that flexibility because the flexibility is not just to cancel, but to renegotiate. So you can say, hey... I had a two-year. I have a two-year contract with you. It's got a sixty-day out. You can file the sixty-day out and then call them up and say, "Yeah, we're canceling, in all likelihood, because we found two other vendors at this cost." But um, we'll keep going if you can match it. But if not, we wanted to get that cancellation in now because we want to be done by October first or whatever it is. It's a very powerful negotiation. Uh, it's a very powerful negotiation technique. Now, things like um, travel people's phones, equipment. Uh, depending on the region in the U.S. you are, there's different expectations. I do not pay for everybody's mobile phones at my companies because it leads to people not looking at the costs. What I just say is we'll pay for salespeople $25 of your $100 a month bill because that's about how much time you're going to use it for your sales job or maybe $35 or something like that. This way, they're not just submitting their bill and not looking at it. Because at some companies, people don't have to look at their bill and they're not responsible over a certain amount. So then they go travel to Europe and they run, run up $1,000 and they put it on the company. And they get lazy about expenses. You want to set the per diem reasonably at the early stages of your company. Per diem is how much you give people when they travel. And you just say, like, hey, we're going to pay for two or three meals. We're going to give you $35 a day, $50 a day. It's not a fancy pants company right now. And then as time goes on, you can increase it. And the booking of travel should always go through a central person in your organization who is cheap as hell. Because I cannot tell you how many times in my history I have seen people buy tickets or rent cars because they're trying to score up points for their two their vacation to Hawaii two years from now. And they're like, oh, I use Delta. Oh, I use American. This is the biggest scam ever done in corporate America. That we give a kickback in points to employees for money being spent by companies for them to make private travel, that's a kickback. That's illegal. But somehow, all these companies call them points when it's really a cash kickback. That would be like taking the company credit card and going and buying lunch at a restaurant saying, I'm going to buy lunch here, charge me an extra $20, and we'll split it. You give me 10 you keep 10 That's what those programs are. Now, I don't mean to seem like you know, like a hardcore, you know, hard ass, like I don't want anybody to get points or miles or something like that. If people incidentally got miles, I wouldn't mind it. But these programs are very significant. They add up. And they're baked into the prices of things. For startup companies, it's unacceptable that people go and goose their spending in order to make their um, 
stuff go up. You know, their, their free points go up. What I do in my companies, all of the points off of all the credit cards that are issued go to one account. That account is where we book our travel from first so that we can conserve cash because we're all here for the bigger prize, which is the equity value of the company. And so you have to have these conversations with people. And sometimes they're uncomfortable. But I feel that if you set a tone of frugality in your company, it will carry on. And when somebody sees somebody do something stupid, like I'm a single person and I'm going to take an SUV instead of taking an Uber X, um, you know, for a third of the price, everybody in the company should just admonish that person. What are you doing? We don't waste money. And, you know, I learned this from a guy named Scott Kernan who was running about.com back in the day. The guy was worth tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars. I got on a flight. And I had gotten upgraded to business class, and he came walking by me. He's a big man, and he sat in coach. And I said, hey, how you doing, and whatever. And I said, hey, you're in coach. He said, I fly coach every time. I'm like, really? Scott Kern flies coach? He's like, absolutely. You know, I, I'm a last-minute traveler. That seat up there where you're in would cost me $2,000. I got this seat for $300. i am not wasting the company's money. I want to put that money into the product. That's the kind of attitude you want to have is that Scott Kern, a cheap bastard, like, we're putting that money into the company no offense, Scott Kernan. We want to put that money into the company, into the product. At all costs, save money. At all costs, put the money into the product. This is the key. This is how I make a lot of my decisions as an entrepreneur. I look at people and I say, is this a person who's distracted and wants to go to Dubai on a speaking gig because they got invited to TEDx Dubai? And they think in some delusional way going to TEDx Dubai is going to move the needle for their enterprise software company in Silicon Valley. Those kind of people are not the people you want to be in business with or investing. They're not focused. Stay focused on the product. Put all the money into the product. And you, yes, you want to treat your employees well. I hope this doesn't sound like I'm being cheap to all employees. What I'm saying is there is a sense of entitlement amongst Silicon Valley employees. And when that gets applied to angel invested in companies, it ruins them. You have to start early with being frugal and disciplined. Frugal and disciplined. When I see people stroll into my office at 10 o'clock and they leave at 5, I stop them. And I say, 10 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 hours, you're getting paid for 8 hours a day, you took an hour and a half lunch. Is that reasonable to your other team members? You know, like, listen, if the person's crushing it and they're working three hours from home, that's fine. And you don't want to be punching the clock. But there is an attitude and there's a sense of entitlement in the industry. And uh, you could have a group of people being very frugal in your company, and then one person like that comes in who is constantly leaving at 3 o'clock, constantly strolling in at 1030, constantly spending extra money, doesn't seem to care about saving money, asks you to pay for their you know, home computer, their home internet connection. Is like I've had people put on their expenses like you know, home computers and their home internet connection. I'm like, you, you're telling me at home you would not have had a home computer and a home internet connection? Come on. Come on. You want to make sure those people are not in your company. It's a tell. Those people who are frivolous with the company's cash, those are people you need to get out early. Or you need to sit them down and say, hey, I know you're used to working at Sony or Google or Microsoft or whatever big company where you spend up to the budget. The budget that we spend at the startup is as little as possible to succeed in that endeavor, whatever it is. So if we're trying to close a client and we can do it over GoToMeeting, we're going to do it over GoToMeeting. We're not going to fly to New York to close it. If we need to fly to New York, we're going to. And in that case, we're taking the cheapest flights. And if we can fly in and out on the same day and skip a hotel room, which I've done many times when I was broke, then we're doing that. F it. Hotels are $500, $600 in Manhattan. We're taking an Airbnb in Brooklyn. I regularly ask people who work for me that if they want to go to other cities and they're doing business, it's great. Do you have somebody you can stay with? Happens all the time. People have friends they can stay with. Great. Save the company the money. Buy yourself a little something extra at dinner. You always want to do that. And as an employee, you should be vocal about saving the company money and being frugal. You don't want to be penny wise, pound foolish. So if there's a piece of software you can get for 50 bucks a month that saves you more than five hour, or three hours of your time and you're getting paid 20 bucks an hour or 30 bucks an hour or 40 bucks an hour, yeah, you want to get that software. And you want to be making those calculations as you go. I make those calculations as I go. People who work for me will tell you many times, I'll say, hey, a $12 an hour intern or somebody working from home could get that done in five hours. What does the software cost? Well, the software costs 500 a month. Okay, five times 12 is 60, $500 a month, $440 difference. Why would we pay $500 a month for that you know, stupid PR database? 
when we could just look up people's emails on Twitter? Why are we going to spend money on Vocus or whatever this nonsense is? Somebody came to me, got to get a Vocus account. I'm like, a Vocus account for $500,000 a month? For what purpose? So you can just type, I need these journalists and get their emails as opposed to just hustling and going getting them for free? What's wrong with you people? But that's what happens. We have those big company people come land in a small company. They just bring all those spending habits with them. And you got to stop that. And you got to be frugal. And when you see that, as when I see that as an entrepreneur, as an angel investor, oh my God. I, one of the questions I ask people is, how, long, how much money did it take you to get to this point in your product? I've seen people show me stuff that looks like a million bucks. And they're like, yeah, that took us six months and three people and $75,000. And But we actually have 50000 of it left. I'm like, what happened? They're like, oh, well, we all worked for free. And, uh, you know, we paid a designer 25 grand to make the app. I'm like, wow, you guys care. Where'd you get the 75K from? Oh, from our parents. Wow. This is the person I want to be in business with. They took their parents' money. They took deferred salaries. They got a lot done with a little bit. And now they're ready to rock and roll. Those people who have to spend tons of money, I've seen it so many times. There's a time to spend a ton of money and not be frugal. Like you're in a race like Uber is with Lyft. Like you can be capital inefficient at times when you're Google versus Yahoo or Amazon versus buy.com. You can be slightly capital efficient and inefficient in those businesses. Facebook can buy a ton of companies and waste money, have a whole division, start up, shut down because they have a money printing machine. Uber, Google, they all have money printing machines. They can make big billion dollar mistakes. They can make $500 million mistakes, 50 million mistakes, $5 million mistakes, $500,000 mistakes. When you're at a startup, you can't make a $50,000 mistake. It could be the end of your life. Be frugal. And thank you to our friends at Wilson Sonsini for supporting Startup Basics. That's all I got for you today. How to save money, how to be a cheap bastard. That's one of my advice today. Be cheap. Save money. Put the money back into your product. Everything on the plate. You know, people go to a restaurant and it's like in the bad part of town and there's the wallpaper's old and the tables are, you know, not sitting properly. And then the person, the chef brings out a plate and you eat that flank steak that's been marinated perfectly. You're like, this is the most amazing restaurant ever. It's like, no, it's not. The restaurant is disgusting. It's on a, the worst street ever. It's the food that's delicious. It's what's on the plate that matters. The plate is your product. It's what people see when they pick up the phone and they press your icon and they open that app. That's what matters in life. That moment, every dollar has to be associated with that moment. And if it's not, if it's associated with the wallpaper, it's associated with how fancy your desk is. You know what? The people who are downloading your goddamn app, they don't see the desk you're sitting in. They don't care. They don't care that you're not in a big fancy pants office. They don't care you fly first class or, or coach or do a go to meeting instead of traveling. All they care about is what's on that tiny screen. What's on the plate matters in the restaurant. What's on the phone matters in startups. That's it. We'll see you next time on Startup Basics. Thanks again to my friends at WSGR, Wilson Sassini. Bye-bye.